Good afternoon, everyone. I am Katie Edwards. We're going to do intros here uh, in a few moments, but thank you so much for, for being here today. Um, really, really excited about this panel with some of my favorite collaborators, um, and we really hope that um, you all learn from us, and we are especially interested in learning from you all, too. Um, before we start, we always like to, to make sure that we're acknowledging the indigenous lands on which we're gathering. Um, today, um, we also want to briefly start with some introductions, and so this is a really big positionality statement. Um, <laughs> for those of you who maybe this is new, what we like to do is we like to be really honest and open with the framework that we're approaching this work. So our work uses an anti-oppressive social justice lens. So when we're working um, around violence prevention, um, especially with structurally minoritized youth, we recognize that much of why we see these disproportionate rates um, is because of structural oppression. And so that's something that's really fundamental to our work, and we'll be talking about that more today. Um, so I'm Katie Edwards. I'm a professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, I direct the Interpersonal Violence Research Laboratory there, where we use Community-Based Participatory Action Research, or PAR, uh, which I will be talking quite a bit about today, um, to answer two questions. How do we prevent sexual and related forms of violence, and how do we best support survivors in the aftermath of violent victimization? And our work focuses on youth and communities of color, as well as queer youth. Hi, y'all. Oh my goodness, is it the lunchtime lag? Okay, let's try one more time. Hi, y'all. Ooh, that's much better. My name is Mia Desiree Clark. I use the she series, or I say I go by she, her, her, so I use feminine pronouns. And I am a practitioner um, specifically focusing in child welfare um, for the last 20 years or so. Um, my story is distinctive in that I am not just a practitioner, I am also a former foster youth. I spent uh, 14 years in the foster care system, where I was placed in more than 15 different placements in two different states. And when I aged out of the system, the hi system hired me, and I've been doing that work ever since, saving the babies. Um, and so, thank you. And so my function here is really as a practitioner. Um, in addition to uh, working as a child welfare consultant, I also focus on justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. And then uh, as a consultant for University of Nebraska-Lincoln as an external investigator, expert advisory board member, with an emphasis on sexual and gender minority youth. Thanks. Great. Hello. I am Stephanie Olson. And I am the CEO of an organization called the Set Me Free Project. We do prevention education on human trafficking, social media safety, and then we, we educate all about healthy relationships. I am personally a survivor of sexual and domestic violence, and so this work has been extremely important to um, not only me personally, but just youth in general. We we really focus on youth and making sure that they can see themselves in our curriculum. We want it to be something very inclusive, something that um, every kiddo is, is looking at and saying, okay, yeah, I can see myself. So that is me in a nutshell. Hey everyone, I'm Robin Koshalev and I'm currently a student at Duke University. The majority of the work I've done, however, happened when I was myself a queer youth and a high school student in Texas, where I was doing a lot of LGBTQ and trans activism, which, as you all know, in Texas is a lot of work and is very draining work. I myself am also a survivor, and I'm wanting to branch out my research experience in order to help support other survivors and prevent this kind of violence from occurring in the future. My name is uh, Ramona Harrington, but I go by Mona, and I've been working with, with um, Dr. Katie Edwards for the last seven years. As um, Right now, I'm an, a cultural outreach manager. We are working with um, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation youth, and that's where I'm from, but I live in Rapid City. We are working to um, currently, right now, um, working on sexual violence prevention within the school systems there. And um, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Stacy Nessa, and I represent 
um, public schools on this panel. Yeah, any public schools in the house? Raise your hand, come on. Um, I am connected, I'm a clinical social worker and I have a unique position. I'm actually employed by Des Moines Public Schools and I um, am a liaison for system involved youth. So kids who are in foster care or juvenile court involved or kids who are still students but um, have adult probation uh, issues. So um, I am connected through Stephanie prior to Katie and um, it's just a really good opportunity to um, bring this work together uh, to impact public schools. Thank you. So, so we collectively do a lot of prevention initiatives together, and, and rather than going through all of those, I'm happy to talk, you know, share more about the different um, the different programming um, initiatives that we do. Um, but we really we really draw a lot from um, evidence based, but also really listening to the voices of our community partners and our youth. Right. So the programming that we do is is skills based. We know that skills are really important. Um, culturally grounded, the work that we do, um, we always try to really uh, make sure that we're operating very much from a culturally relevant framework. So our work on Pine Ridge, we are very closely aligning that with Lakota virtues and values. Um, the other thing that's so important is affirming. Um, you know, I will say that the youth that we work with, if they're queer youth, youth of color, um, you can teach them all the skills in the world, um, but if they don't feel like that, they're ma that they matter and then they're, they're worth using those skills, um, it, it doesn't do anything, and I'm a firm believer in that. And so we really, really try to make sure that our work um, is really, really affirming and uplifting. Um, Anti-oppressive, again, we, you know, while we're doing programming with youth, families, and communities, thinking about how do we dismantle these larger systems of oppression. Um, and anti-oppressive can happen at the individual level too and at the relational level. So a lot of times when we're working with youth that come in and that they're feeling like there's something just really wrong with them, having critical conversations with them about where are those messages coming from, uh, helping them to understand. I'll never forget the, one of the very first program sessions we did with sexual and gender minority youth. A youth came in and said, I, we're all going to be pedophiles. That's what I. That's what I've grown up hearing. Is that because we're LGBTQ plus, we're we're pedof we're much more likely to be pedophiles. And we had we really talked to that youth. about well, where's that message coming from, right? And there was something really, really healing uh, for that youth to hear that that's actually not true, right? And there is a there's some there's really power in in helping youth to understand where these messages are coming from, and and, and to invite them in towards these larger efforts. Um, so again, our work is largely with uh, youth and communities of color, queer youth, um, and so that's a lot of what we're we're drawing on. And 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 I really believe that when you you take these approaches, you are you particularly when you're doing participatory work, which I'll define here in a second. Um, you know, we're seeing in our, our work that we're moving the needle. I mean, we're seeing reductions in violence in our studies. We're seeing reductions in sexual violence and adverse childhood experiences. Some of our, you know, if you know the literature well, a lot of times if you like dissect it, like the programs are not working. They're not working for sexual minority youth. They're working for het youth. Um, and we actually are finding the opposite in our work. So, so really excited to be sharing um, the power of partnerships because I think that's why what we're doing is working is because we have partnerships that have youth at the table, that have elders at the table, that have education educators at the table, that have practitioners at the table, um, and not just people like me who are researchers. Um, so one of the things that I think is like so important, and I, do, I have to stop and do this sometimes, right? Because we're just like in go, go, go mode, there's a million things to do, but I'm like, why am I doing this work? Like, what are my values in, in the work that I do? And so that's just something for you all to think about as we're going, going through this, is you know, what are the values that you bring to your work? And for many of us, like, right, like, Oftentimes it's not a nine to five job. Like this is something that is so, so personal um, and something that we're so passionate about and thinking about what are the values that we bring to this work um, and how does that operate um, in our day-to-day -day lives. So I'm just really curious, how many, how many people in here are, would consider yourself a researcher? Okay. And how many would say like practitioner, advocate, educator, Okay, awesome. Um, how many people have heard of participatory action research? 
Okay, cool. Awesome. So, so right, there's different ways of doing research. Like you can go into a community and say, I'm an expert and this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it, right? Which I actually personally think is highly unethical. Um, or you can stand alongside a community and really, really utilize their perspectives, their strengths, their voices. And you can do that from the very beginning. So when I'm writing grants, for example, I'm writing them with practitioner partners. I don't say here, write this 200 page grant, but I listen to them and I write what they say and what they want to, what they want to be heard to funders in that application and then situate it within the academic literature. So participatory action research, it's an entire approach to doing research. It's democratic, it's equitable, and it's liberating. And it's action. So we're doing research to, to make change, right? It's not just research because this is cool, but it's research to actually make change in society and in communities. And it involves the authentic collaboration of all researchers and community stakeholders as equal partners. And it's all phases of the research. And the, the work that we all do together and the work that happens within my laboratory or our laboratory is, is rooted in PAR. Um, it also really acknowledges that the, the, the concerns within a community um, are defined and solved by that community, right? Um, and so that the, 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 ultimately the community concerns um, are what help to improve the lives of others. Um, and that we all are learners and uh, learners and facilitators. Um, so this is a, a pretty much just a summary of kind of what I talked about. Um, but I think the collaboration and shared purpose, the commitment to diversity and inclusivity, uh, transparency and trust is really important. Um, and of course, having fun throughout this process. Um, and again, this is often between researchers, practitioners, survivors youth and educators um, within a community. Um, and again, that's really the approach that we that we all use in our work um, and that we will be sharing about here a little bit next. So what we're gonna do is have each person, based on some of the different participatory action research, uh, programming initiatives that they have done, um, share some words of wisdom, lessons learned, um, and then after that, we'll open it up for you all to share, share as well. So I'm gonna first turn it over to Mona. Thank you, Katie. Um, she talked. She asked me to talk about um, the lessons learned on being um, in the, you know, cultural part, and that is very um, for me. It's very humbling, and you have to stay humble because somebody will put you in your place every time, and it's usually um, an elder, and I'm considered an elder. <laughs> I'm going to tell you how old I am, but anyway, um, so um, we have to, you know, really take into the cultural aspect, um, and we use our, we try to use um, the cultural virtues, virtues and values of the Lakota um, community, and um, it's very simple. It's, um, I think that if we lived by those virtues and values, everybody, we could save the world. <laughs> so if you ever have, ever have questions about it, I'll be glad to talk to you. Although I am learning myself, you know, it wasn't until 1978 that we were able to practice our culture openly. I mean, we, um, we'd be arrested, I guess, if, if we did it. We started doing sun dances and, um, things like that, being able to speak our language and to um, be able to um, sing. And that singing is a really part, big part of our culture. And I'm not talking about like um, hip hop singing or anything, I'm talking about um, the, the um, ceremonial songs. We have a ceremonial song for everything that we do. And um, so, in, order to learn it, we have to be able to um, actually see it and, and, and to be there. And that's been hard because um, in, on our reservation, we don't have the um, money to, to get stuff like that going. So I'm really, really happy that we, um, we are able to do this work, do the work that we do. And, um, to be able to learn. Um, I've been called an apple, and I don't know if anybody knows what an apple is. It's a, 
I'm, I'm red on the outside and white on the inside. And that is not true. I, I, I was like, I can't believe I was called an apple because I, I tried to practice my um, cultural um, ways all the time. So I, I was just like really hurt that that happened. And, um, you know, trying to, um, Katie, Katie is um, such a great leader. She comes in and she is really part of everything and she wants to learn. And that's what we need is to be able to step in and to not judge, to um, become part of the culture. And um, this past, no, that was last summer, um, we worked with um, some LGBTQ youth and we did a, um, I think it was only a three day program, but they kept wanting us to come back and um, it was so inspiring because not only do they have to um, prove themselves because of this, their color, but also because of um, who they choose to love. And and um, it was really humbling to see that um, they have so much to worry about. They don't have any support. In, in the native community. And so, you know, they wanted us to come and to have something going. And um, with the um, project that we're working on right now, we pr will probably be able to do that because we're gonna have circles, talking circles, which is really effective um, among the native community. They, it's, you know, it, we do that anyway in our community, so. Um, but the drugs and alcohol is so prevalent there that it um, really, really has an effect on the, ch the kids, you know, and, and, and um, we did an ACES um, grant in the Rapid City community, and it was so eye-opening to see that our um, parents were taken out of their homes and um, were foster parents, most of them, I mean foster kids, and never learned their cultural identity. So it really has a big impact on who we are when you, you're not able to do that. So I think that's part of the problem of um, the, the things that are happening with our youth and our um, young people. Um, so uh, I don't know how much longer I can talk. <laughs> But um, it's really important to learn learn the culture, and um, it's just not um, everything is sad because once you start engaging, it's a lot of fun, and um, I just love youth, and um, I'm so glad that I get to work with them. Thank you. All right, well, I guess it's me. So, um, you know, as the CEO and founder of an organization that does prevention education on human trafficking, it was really important for us as we were moving into that space because a lot of good things were happening in the area of counter trafficking. However, no one was talking to the youth and they are so um, vulnerable to some of those things. And so we saw a lot of stereotypical things going on in the counter trafficking world. So the big bad traffickers were all black males and the, ironically enough, the, the um, victims, because that's what everybody called them, were blonde, white, blue haired, girls. And we know this is not the case. We know that um, there is a very big um, portion of people of color who are um, very vulnerable populations. The LGBTQ plus population is highly vulnerable. And I always say, not because they're LGBT, but because they might be displaced. They might not feel accepted. So why are we not doing what we need to do to really talk to the individuals who might be at risk? And that's how we really got started. And so it was really important for us to bunk some of those Ms. out there, not only just out there in the human trafficking conversation, but within people in the industry. 
that were experiencing some of the same things, um, some of the same myths that they were protecting perpetuating. So that was extremely important to us. And that's how we began. We were asked by a couple of um, educators in the community, hey, what do you see? You know, what, what, what do we need to do? And we said, we'll look for a curriculum. Now, we are not the type of people to reinvent the wheel, right? The less work we can possibly do to get the, is better. So we didn't want to write a curriculum. But when we went and looked for curriculum, everything was really fear-based. Everything was really stereotypical. Everything was just, I mean, human trafficking is a horribly scary thing already. Why do we need to add to that? Why do we need to sensationalize it? So we actually decided we needed to write a curriculum that was for youth, that was engaging, that was interactive, that was fun, and despite the conversation, we were going to bring some humor to it. And what we always said is we take our topic extremely seriously. We do not take ourselves extremely seriously. And we know that when uh, we have humor with, co with conversation, with discussion, we actually retain better. So that's how we began. I keep saying we as if I have a mouse in my pocket, but... I kind of do. We'll just say that I do. So, but it was really important that the youth actually were guiding these conversations too. That we're not just saying, hey, human trafficking is bad, sexual violence, a bad thing. This is what's going on. Good luck. No, we want to hear from the experts in the room. We want to hear from the youth. And, and what are you experiencing? What are you seeing in your communities? What are those things that, that we can glean from you? Because they truly are the experts in what's going on in our communities in these, in these conversations. So that was really important. But we also wanted to make sure that we were giving an authentic voice to the curriculum. Here's what I always say about youth. You have 30 seconds to capture their attention. And if they spot any inauthentic thing in you, you're out, right? You do not have much time. And so if you're working with youth, you better, first of all, like youth, right? I think that's a really important thing. But then you better be ready to just be yourself around them, but to acknowledge them and give them priority. And so here's one of the things I do. Okay, yes. One of the things I always do for an example of the importance of value. Now, when you're talking about human trafficking, there is this mindset of monetary value and people being, quote unquote, valuable, right, to the trafficker. So you have value as a uh, to me as a trafficker. That's what we want to remove. And so what we want youth to understand, frankly, what we all want to understand is that we all have an intrinsic value that cannot change. That's human dignity. doesn't matter what we do. We're born with human dignity. We're born with worth. We're born with that intrinsic value. Now, this is what I do to really drive that home. And I'm going to talk about the monetary thing in here in just a second. But if you could just all pretend you're like eighth graders for me for just a second. For some of you, that will be easier than others. So here we go. How many want a $20 bill? Yes. Okay, smart people. Now, let's face it. As adults, this will buy you half a Starbucks. And in San Francisco, a third, right? Okay, so yes. Now, what if I take this $20 bill and I fold it in a square? You still want it? Okay, crumple it in a ball, still want it? Spit on it? Oh, some of you are like, no. But money, cash is dirty, right? You know what I'm saying? If you are holding cash, you're holding someone's spit. I'm just going to tell you that right now. So what does this $20 bill have that I have destroyed? I've called it a stupid, disgusting $20 bill. What does it still have? still has value. That's what our kids need to know, that it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your sexual identity. It doesn't matter how much money your parents have or how much money they don't have. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter who you live with. You have an intrinsic value that cannot be changed. 
and it doesn't matter. I could say a whole bunch of crappy things to you, which I would never do because you're amazing people, but if I did that, it wouldn't change who you are, your intrinsic value. That's what they need to know. Now, why do we use money? Or, and we have, this is our, the foundation of all we do, but diamonds or anything monetary, we've had people say, well, what about using the analogy with youth that at the end of their life, that money is not going to be, if they're on their deathbed, they're not going to be like, hey, money, that was really important to me. Why don't we do that? Anybody want to give a guess? why we wouldn't use something like, because that doesn't make sense to youth, right? I mean, deathbed, that's not gonna make sense. If, when I was a youth, I was invincible. There was no deathbed for me. And it doesn't even matter what I'm seeing around me, it doesn't matter the community I'm in. So those things don't always hit home, but I know that money, has a value, there's a specific thing. And so we do use that just to reach. It's about reaching kids where they're at, reaching youth where they're at, and pulling out that understanding. So the final thing I'm gonna talk about really is um, cultural humility. That's one of the things that we're really working on with educators in the community as we're talking, but also community members, that our youth, and all of us come from different experiences. We've all grown up in different homes. We've all grown up with different ideas. And we were even talking about some of that today, just the perception of, of community is going to depend on where you've come from in that. And so it is really important to us for um, as we're working with youth, that we do have cultural humility. That what I have experienced may not and probably isn't what you have experienced. And so we need, and the humility part is that key word there, that we need to come to the table with that understanding that I don't necessarily see from your perspective because we come from different ones. And so I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna honor that. But then also, as we can, and this kind of depends where we are in the whole spectrum of, of the workplace, but when we are serving youth, we want to be able to provide um, people to serve them who look like them. Because when we're talking about youth disclosing, who are they gonna disclose to? People who look like them, people who have that understanding of where they are coming from. So, I think that's it, yes, and you. Uh, when we're talking about amazing people, can I just say, I'm just gonna give Robin a little introduction. Um, this is an absolutely amazing human being because when I was Robin's age, I was not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of things I was doing that I'm not going to talk about, but I was not doing this. So kudos to you for being so amazing. Thank you. So I differ a little bit from the other people on this panel in that I have significantly less uh, research and professional experience. I myself am 18, a large majority of the work that I've done. <laughs> A large majority of the work that I've done happened from ages 15 through 18 when I was a high school student in kind of the north of Austin area in Texas. So that's where I'm coming from, and I come from a situation where I was doing a lot of queer-centric activism, where I was doing a lot of work with incarcerated people, and I'm mostly going to be talking about my own experience observing youth, my classmates, my peers, because that's what I can most inform you all about. So I think... As Stephanie touched on this as well, the, the adultism that have, a lot of youth have internalized really does affect how they see themselves and their worth and their capabilities. Because what I've witnessed, not only in myself, but in others, is a lot of youth who don't see their inherent worth. They don't see their experiences as unique or valuable, or see themselves as having the capacity to change the world. 
Now, when we get into higher achieving students who want to change things about their community, they oftentimes see even that change as coming from things they can do, people that are experts they can partner with, people they can intern under. That's still an expert-focused mindset. That's a top-down mindset. What I don't see, and honestly, I'm still unlearning this myself, is youth that think that their unique experiences and lives are the things that are going to cause change. They're the things that have value. Yeah. And I think the, the number one priority when you're going to be working with youth, either in a collaborative way or in just an educational way, is helping them see their own value, helping them see that what they have gone through, what they have to say about the world, is just as legitimate as what you have to say, even though you might have a degree or professional experience, or you might be the one in the front of the room talking on the mic. And making sure that they can really internalize that message and know that you see them as an intellectual equal is the first step towards getting them to open up and share what they have learned, because they've learned a lot. The issue is they're not sharing it because they don't see it as a lot. They see it as just another Tuesday. And you have to make sure that they know that you are looking to learn about those Tuesdays, those experiences. And the second thing, and this comes mostly from my experience as a queer youth, is safety. Especially if you're working with youth in a predominantly red state or a red area or just in a unfriendly district. And honestly, they don't even have to be red. They just have to be uncertain. If a youth doesn't know whether or not the area in is safe, safe to say that they're queer, safe to just be a person of color in, safe to disclose experiences of sexual trauma and violence, if they don't know, they're going to err on the side of caution. They're going to shut down. They're going to retreat. They're going to talk to people that are similar to them and like them, and they're not going to reach out towards practitioners or towards trusted adults because they don't know if they can trust those adults. There's also a lot of mixed information when it comes to things like mandated reporting or confidentiality policies. And I myself have seen a lot of my peers when we were underage opt out of getting therapy or talking to school counselors because they don't know what's going to be told to their parents, what's going to be told to their teachers. And for youth that are in uncertain or unsafe situations, they, don't, they want to have control over who gets to know what. And once you share that information with someone else, you lose control of that. And I think making sure that youth know that they have the primary agency over their experiences and what happens to them and what happens to the information that they're going to share is going to be what propels them forward. Now, of course, there are legal constraints here. Mandated reporting is mandated reporting. But you should still make youth aware of that in an explicit way. Because right now, if you go on the internet and you try to find like a single district's mandated reporting policy, have fun with the links. <laughs> Speaking as someone who's had to do that, it's a lot. And I think just for educators or practitioners, making sure that you openly and actively say, this is what I can and can't share this is where, what's going to happen with the information. Here's what I absolutely have to do in accordance with the law. And other than that, you are the, the warden of the information experiences that you are sharing. And you have the agency there. That's going to be the number one thing. And the second thing, of course, is general safety. A lot of practices, especially I've noticed in more progressive areas like Austin, don't always say that they're LGBTQ or queer friendly not because they're not, but because they assume that it's a de facto aspect of their existence. Like, oh yeah, we, we do sexual assault prevention work in a progressive area. Why wouldn't we accept queer people? But for youth that are coming from potentially dangerous scenarios or situations or backgrounds, they need to see just a sticker. This is a safe space. They need to see those initial performative aspects of allyship, like, what are your pronouns? Here are my pronouns. What, what is your orientation? Where are you, what, what do you identify as? Where do you come from? Just making sure that youth know that this is a space where they are safe to be who they are, and they are safe to share their experiences and be open, and signaling that really, really in the beginning of your first interaction is going to be vital to ensuring that they feel safe enough to reach out. And another thing, and this is especially relevant to me because a lot of the work that I've done collaborating with Katie has been over the internet, is accessibility. If you're trying to reach out toward 
to youth that are, say, scattered throughout the US or even the world. You have to be aware of the potential gaps in communication, especially when we get into the more rural red areas where internet access is not always a given. And even more than that, internet access in a private space is not a given. Because you can go to a public library, you can maybe have internet at home, but having just internet and having a space where you can sit down and get on a call and talk to people is definitely something different. So ensuring that you are being mindful of these gaps in reach and gaps in accessibility and allowing youth to, youth that might not have had a chance to speak before, chance to come forward is really important. Now when it comes to solutions to accessibility, it gets a bit wonkier, especially if you're doing online work. But I think specifically the way that we, me and Katie structured the PRISM project, which is a project that was aimed at rural LGBTQ youth, is to specifically put out uh, advertisements or communication that would uh, attract youth from that area. For example, I was one of the people that filmed a short Instagram thing and uploaded it. How many people saw it again? A million? No one's approached me on the street yet, but I'm terrified of the day that it happens. It's like, oh, I saw you on that commercial. Yeah, so just making sure that you're being mindful of the potential gaps in population that you're reaching and that the work that you're doing isn't just centered around the youth in the rich school districts, the youth who have continuous internet access, the youth in progressive areas, because they need help too. But the people that really need help are the ones that you're not thinking about immediately, that you're not immediately getting to communicate with. Now when it comes to, okay, so what do we do about this? Lessons learned, but what are the solutions? I think the two most important things is making sure that the work that you're doing is outwardly and openly inclusive, that you're signaling to youth that they are safe here, that they have agency, and that their experiences are important and powerful, and only, like their experiences alone are what can like make that change. So it's not just, ah, if you do this work with me and you complete these projects or these tasks, you're valuable. It's just you sharing your story, being here, communicating with me is valuable. I think the last thing is something that I didn't think about before, but I have now gone, come to appreciate ever since working with Katie, is the opportunities for professional development. Because I myself was wanting to get into research and wanting to start doing like community work. And although I could do that a little bit, in the area that I was, there wasn't a lot of A, safety, and B, access to humanities or social work centered. It was all STEM and business. So especially as a high school student in a fairly rural or suburban-ish area, getting the chance to, through sharing my experiences and opinions with Katie, also get opportunities to further my own ambitions in terms of community work and research was really valuable. And it made me feel like I also had the capacity to do the work that she does and be inspired by her and her colleagues. And that's honestly what set me on this track. And without those opportunities for professional development, I don't think I would be here today. So I'm pretty sure that's all. Making, yeah, you got that. Thank you. Um, so, wow. Okay. Um, I just want to give you kudos because I, I was saying to Robin before we started, like, you are the one with the most expertise in this room because you're living through it now. Um, you are seeing things and you are privy to conversations that none of us are, are able to have as the adults, um, older adults. But you make me, you remind me of Kendrick Lamar when he says, we gonna be all right. <laughs> Getting told that I remind you of Kendrick Lamar is like the best compliment I've been given. <laughs> Yes, if you are the future, if you are our future, I am very impressed and I am, I'm, I'm feeling a sense of calm wash over me. Um, so, um, as I said before, my name is Nia Clark. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I wanted to actually um, have a conversation with you uh, to kind of alarm you to some of the things that are going on for LGBTQ plus people, and most particularly LGBTQ plus youth right now. But in order to do that, we have to make sure that you have the right foundation. What often happens among LGBTQ individuals from people who are not part of the community is we end up being pathologized 
people are always trying to figure out how we became LGBTQ. What is it that happened to you to make you this way? And then we're also medicalized. What things have been done to you in order to uh, be the person that's standing in front of me today? And so as a practitioner, someone who has worked with children, youth, and families for a very long time, I try to help folks to not understand the how we got here, but what's going on right now. And understanding what are some of the stressors that are leading to these poor outcomes for these young people. So focusing less on the pathology of how they got here and the pathology of what stressors are leading to such negative and poor outcomes. By show of hands, who has heard of Meyer's minority stress model? By show of hands. Okay, so some of you. Uh, by show of hands, who's heard of the 2014 update to the model that includes gender minorities? I see one hand raised, okay. So what you're looking at right now is Meyer's stress model. And this is essentially a model to help you understand the specific types of stress that LGBTQ plus youth go through on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm not going to get into the whole model. I want you to focus on the second column. And so what are the types of stress that young people typically go through? What are the things that are stressful to a young person, regardless of their identity? School, what else? Friends, what else? Sex, okay, what else? Appearance, what about appearance? Okay, what else? Parents, what about parents is stressful? They don't understand, right? Mm -hmm. So if that's the general stress that most young people go through, then we have to talk about what can compound that stress, right? So what are some other ways that a young person might be stressed outside of what's going on in their home or what's going on in their community? Peer pressure. Peer pressure. Social media. How might their intersecting identities impact their stress? If we're including intersectionality, how might it be more stressful for black or brown youth taking on some of this? What are the additional stressors that black and brown youth are facing today? Police? What about the police? Stereotypes, fear, okay. What else? Racism? So almost uh, a school to prison pipeline, if you will. Mm -hmm. Others. Hypersexualization. Yes. And also being adultified, right? When I say adultified, what does that mean for all of you? Who can give me examples of the ways that black and brown youth are adultified? Yes, in the back. So seeing two young people in the same outfit, one being black and one not being black, because of certain curvature, because of the certain body structure, your body automatically being policed as sexual, your body automatically being up for debate as being sexual, right? Okay, so now that we've had that conversation about the different ways that uh, black and brown youth experience stress, that youth in general experience stress, now I'm gonna talk about this, the two types of stress that LGBTQ youth face. The first is actually known as distal stress. So this is external stress. So it's the stress that young people get from all around them, okay? So if you were an LGBTQ plus youth, what might be some of the types of things that would stress you out? What are the things that are going on in homes, in schools, and communities that would specifically stress out an LGBTQ plus youth? And raise your hand, please, and I'll run. Okay. Transphobic rhetoric in the media, seeing it all over the news all the time. So the media in general, having a, tr a transphobic skew or transphobic rhetoric, as you said, yes. What else? I don't know, but I was trying to just connect it in with so many stress that many young people face, mostly young biracial kids and everything. So like a uh, stress of like self-identification when they're trying to define who they are in a process. Because I feel like uh, the this world society is naming or get pointing up to you. This is who you are, but who are you by yourself? Like, who, who, how do you identify yourself? 
as a person. So I think many young people go through that stage where they, you know, people of color, they say, who I don't want to be, who do I want to be? And most in, in most case scenarios, that is that pressure that is on them to find out who they are and who they want to be based on uh, different from what the society want them to be. Yes, so there are certain structures in our society, even within communities of color, even within some of these marginalized groups, where there are expectations about how you're supposed to show up. So almost like respectability. What is respectable for you as a black person to uh, demonstrate as far as masculinity is concerned, femininity is concerned, all of those are additional external stressors. What about on um, maybe a more, what's going on at school that might stress out an LGBTQ plus youth? But depending on where you live, mm -hmm. so I come from a space that has a lot of private religious schools, depending on what school you go to, that just might not even be something you are allowed to even talk about or is even acknowledged. So just the school in general, that community that you're in doesn't acknowledge your existence, whether you're out or not. So the silence almost in itself is deafening. This idea that you don't even exist because no one's even talking about people who are like you. Mm -hmm. I saw this hand here. Mm -hmm. Also just bathroom usage and mm. all, of, all of the parents um, of kids who are not queer or parents of kids who are queer but they don't know that their kids are queer who are pushing for like rules about bathrooms and pronouns and what's being taught in schools and what the kids have access to. Just, yeah, terrifying. So we're looking beyond just the micro of what's happening, conversations that are happening at home. We're also looking at that mezzo that's going on within the schools and in the community. And then you've actually expanded out into the macro, which is policy. Policies, laws. We now know that there are um, almost 600 pieces of anti-LGBTQ legislation that have been introduced in the United States this year. I believe 75 have been passed and largely targeting transgender youth and transgender people. One more comment. Hi, I also want to mention that I am from Texas, so I apologize for my state, but I'm from Houston, not Texas. Um, I would also say sports, especially because Texas is so big on sports and the culture of, you know, like, it doesn't matter how you identify, you're going to go here and you're going to go here. Yes, so sports being a really divisive topic, it really being this wedge issue, especially for trans youth right now. So these are all the external things that are going on for a young person, right? And as I said before, these are referred to as distal stress. And so it's anti-LGBTQ legislation. It's any anti-LGBTQ violence as well. I just heard about, uh, in California, about a woman, a business owner, age 66. Who heard that story by show of hands? Okay, what's that story? Um, I believe that the woman was shot because she had a pride flag outside of her business that she owned. Just for having a pride flag displayed, being an ally, this woman was shot and killed. That's what's going on. So if you are a young person and you hear about all of these things happening externally, you're experiencing some of that violence yourself, it all seeps in and becomes internalized. And that is what is known as proximal stress. And it shows up in three ways. Number one, you're going to expect to be rejected. Because if the world around me treats me as less than, of course you're gonna to continue to treat me as such. No matter how nice you are to me, no matter how accepting you say you are, I'm expecting that you're gonna treat me like crap. The second would be um, concealment of identity. That's something that Robin did a really good job talking about. If you are a young person and you have a fear that you may be shot or that you may experience some sort of violence or that you may be one of the 40% of homeless youth that are actually LGBTQ, did you know that? Nearly half of all of the youth experiencing homelessness in the United States are LGBTQ+. If you're afraid of losing your housing, you may not come out. And then lastly is internalized homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. It's when you actually believe that you are not deserving of love 
is when you actually believe you're not deserving of a positive and healthy future in space. And so when we have conversations around the pathology of why LGBTQ plus people exist, we're not, oftentimes it goes to the place of, well, you know, it's because you're LGBT that you're having such negative outcomes. And that's not really the, the reality. It's because of how LGBTQ people are treated that we internalize those things that are happening around us. And that's when you see some of these negative outcomes. You see the mental health issues. You see young people either isolating themselves or being ostracized from society, or actually being uh, excommunicated from society. And that's when you see the influx of substance use as well. But there are two things, if you just click advance the slide once, thank you. There are two things that actually can help to counter that. And that's where you all come in. And number one, it would be positive coping skills. And number two, social supports. I'm going to give you some guidance on how you can actually establish yourself as a positive person. So one of the most important moments for an LGBTQ plus youth is when they decide to come out. And when I say come out, I don't really like the term come out because people often think of this as some, some sort of a once in a lifetime moment and they never have to do it again. But coming out often happens in stages and it happens repeatedly over a lifetime. There'll be moments when I'm like actually sitting um, on a plane and someone will ask me questions about my partner or ask me questions about uh, if I have a tampon, for instance. Um, if I have certain things, and I, I forgot to mention that I am a woman of transgender experience. Hello. Oh, I get applause just for being alive? Really? Okay. And so I have to make those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so for trans folks, we don't refer to this as coming out. We defer, refer to this as disclosure. But in general, I don't think about it as coming out. I think about it more of as inviting in. I'm inviting you into my world. I'm inviting you into this vulnerable part of me. Because when a young person comes out for the first time, they're really asking a question. And so one of my functions as a trainer, um, I work for Human Rights Campaign Foundation. We have a program called All Children, All Families. And we really seek to educate more providers on how to work with youth in systems of care and these critical moments. So some, just some tips on how to respond to a young person is to first acknowledge your own feelings internally. Sometimes when a young person comes out to the, for the first time, you're not ready to have that conversation. And you're not really knowing where you stand on this young person identifying or, or sharing with you whom they are. So spend a moment, one, as a crisis management um, trainer, um, when we talk about how to interact in a crisis or how to show up in a crisis, the first question you're supposed to ask yourself is, how am I feeling, right? and then being able to respond accordingly. Thank them, because they trust us, because they didn't have to tell us. They didn't have to tell us anything. They could have kept this part from uh, us, and it would, you would notice that dynamic continued to play out with us, right? Reinforce that you're trustworthy. You can say that, thank you for telling me, I really appreciate this, I'm so glad that you told me, right? Tell them that you care about them, right? They have to be able to hear that. If the question is, do you still love me? Do you still care about me? It's really answering in that moment, yes. Ask what you can do to support them. This is where adultism kind of comes in, as Robin was talking about. Sometimes when we as the adults, especially the practitioners in the room, the social workers, the teachers, the ones that are ready to go with the resources, they're automatically going to offer those in the moment, right? But take a step back. And remember that this is a youth-centered experience. So asking their permission to help is most important in that moment. Not presuming that you already have answers. Like we've gone through it, some of us older queer folks, we, I call it the staples button, like the easy button at staples. I already have the solutions. But let me actually see if there's a problem. This might just be a declaration. I might not need to supply any answers or information. Ask who else knows, right? because you may be the very first person. See what their web of support is or their network is, if they have any. And then lastly, keep it private and or confidential if possible, if and when possible, okay? This is something that I offer to any practitioners who 
Maybe you retained all of this information. You think that when a young person comes out to you, I automatically know what I'm going to say, right? But then you have a deer in the headlights moment. And you don't know what to say. Here is some language for you that you can use in the future. Thank you for sharing this with me. This is new to me, but I want you to know that I care about you and I will continue to be here for you. Did this require any knowledge of the terminology around LGBTQ plus folks, the demographics, the statistics, none of that? It, it communicates three things. Number one, I appreciate you for sharing this with me. That's vulnerable, vulnerability. Number two, this is new to me. Imagine being the adult that says, I don't have all the answers. I know that's really hard for some of us, right? This is new to me, but I want you to know that I care about you and I will continue to be here for you. There are all, all sorts of ways that you can use your own lexicon, your own language to say this, but this is essentially the message we want to emote. There is um, a theoretical framework, it's known as existential helping. Has anyone, by show of hands, who's ever heard of existential helping? There are four stages of it. The first is holding. And this is the phase that often young people are in where they're just getting to know you as an adult and they may not trust you yet. They see that you, there is some potential and you really have to learn how to hold space for them. It means not being defensive when they um, state that you may have committed some microaggressions. It means being consistent. For me, as a foster kid, it was the table setting. I always think about it as setting the table because like I said, I've been in 15 different homes and every time I went to a new foster home, they, depending on, on the environment and the culture, they would have dinner together. And so usually they would set a, a place for me, but because I didn't trust the environment, I didn't sit at the table. I would take my food and I would eat it in my room. But eventually they always, like one thing that was constant is they always set that table for me. And eventually I grew to a place where I had enough trust to sit down and eat with them. That is how you should really think about working with LGBTQ plus youth and any sort of young uh, black or brown youth, marginalized youth, is learning a way to not only set that table, but set it to be consistent in a way that eventually they sit down to eat. Next would be telling. So when a young person actually decides to invite you in, this is that telling phase. They're beginning to tell you about the things that are going on for them, the realities that they see. They're beginning to trust in your relationships. Um, and that is where the youth, youth adult partnership is really, really strong. They're telling you what's going on for them. What we're gonna talk about now is how to get to the next phase, which is uh, mastering. And so mastering is really learning how to make meaning of the things that have happened to me. So I look at the totality of my life, I look at the abuse that I went through, I look at the experience in foster care, all of that, and I'm starting to make connections and adult is helping me to do that. So by me explaining to you what that model was around minority stress, it's helping to understand exactly what the stresses I'm facing are. I'm making meaning of the things that are happening to me and I'm not internalizing those things, right? And then the last is honoring. And you actually saw that today. Robin actually is, stand up one more time because you're so great. Robin is the personification of honoring your experience. Someone who has gone through it, someone who has started to make meaning of the experiences that they've gone through and are now here uh, actually orating to you outcomes that they want to see in the future. That's how we get young people to actually show up for themselves. It's making them the center of their own experiences. Thank you, you can sit down. You're so awesome. So thinking about ways that you can help young people to not only master some of the traumatic experiences they've gone through, not only to master some of the uh, discrimination that they face, but figuring out ways that they can honor those experiences. I am literally proof of honoring that experience. I've survived, I've thrived, and I'm here telling you how to get through it now. Okay? My last slide, I just wanna share. So I did become an author last year. Yes, thank you. Um, and so uh, I worked on a book, it's a, a textbook for Oxford University 
on supporting um, its social work practice with LGBTQ plus youth and adults. And so I introduce what is called the gender affirmation model. Um, it's kind of extrapolated from a, a lot of different sources, but giving you some concrete tools that you can take with you today to begin to support trans and gender non-conforming, non-binary, gender expansive, sex, excuse me, gender minority youth, okay? So this looks like gender affirmation, which I said before. Um, gender affirmation, that means using affirm names and pronouns. It means demonstrating external validation and support. I love this outfit today. You look great. You think I look freak too? External validation and support. That's what that can look like, right? Um, training and, and education for service providers. Building partnerships with communities, employers, landlords, health providers, law enforcement. It's advocating for trans-inclusive language in local, state, and federal policy, especially now. Um, and then we talk about culturally responsive interventions. So this is thinking beyond just uh, uh, youth being sexual and gender minorities, thinking of them as being neurodiverse, thinking of them as being black or brown, or thinking of them as being possibly Jewish or uh, Muslim, right? It's learning the risk factors that are specific to their intersecting identities, looking at their social locations, right? It's communication patterns and styles. You notice that I was snapping like this? That's because that's what I picked up from house and ball culture. It's something that I take with me everywhere to be culturally responsive to the black and brown folks in the room who may know. I know there's some folks back there who know. I see a couple snaps back there, yes. But culturally responsive uh, uh, communication patterns and, and styles. Understanding ethnic and racial identities and some of the stressors that come with the expectations from within that culture. Attitudes around relationships. This is uh, really big, especially if you're having conversations around sexual health. What are the attitudes around relationships? Trauma histories, barriers to accessing services. These are the things that you need to know if you're gonna be able to uh, effectively serve uh, sexual, excuse me, gender minority youth. And then lastly would be trans-inclusive data collection and documentation. We see right now that cissexism Anybody know what cissexism is? I see one hand raised. Who wants to give me a working definition of cissexism? It is the belief that transgender people do not exist, or if that they do exist, they are inferior to cisgender people. So transphobia is what happens at interpersonal levels. If you say something transphobic to me, if it happens at community levels, cissexism is the policy that erases us. So sexism is me, actually, um, I was on a layover um, actually to see Katie in Iowa, and I had a layover in Dallas. So sexism is it being illegal for me to use the women's restroom. So sexism is me being charged with a second degree sexual indecency misdemeanor for using that bathroom. It is literally the belief that transgender people are not who they know themselves to be and effectively writing them out of, out, out of society, right? And so the ways that we counter that, oh, excuse me, I'm, I'm over time, huh? I'm sorry. The ways that we counter that are to actually include trans-inclusive data collection uh, and documentation. And so we have these slides available. Um, the APA recently had a seventh edition of their manual where they have instructions on how you can effectively do that. So I'm over time, but I'm going to pass it on to Stacy. Okay. Thank you. Um, I can keep mine fairly brief. And instead of reading my slides, as I've been listening to my friends here present, I, I'm switching my um, kind of what I'm going to say, and I think it's just because I'd rather take you on a little bit of a journey and tell a story than to read the slide. So um, I am, um, I live in Des Moines, Iowa, and um, Katie and, and Stephanie um, are working, we're working on a CDC grant there um, with Ste testing Stephanie's uh, curriculum on human traffic prevention. Um, 
Des Moines is um, about a half million people. We have 30,000 students, um, very rural, biggest um, city in the state. But we speak 120 languages. So our diversity is um, really insane. Like it's, it's um, more, we have more languages than we can actually find interpreters for. Um, so eight years ago, um, I got this position where I'm a system liaison, which led me to um, being trained in, uh, to be a trainer in human trafficking through a curriculum called GEMS. And that then allowed me to be on a multidisciplinary team um, within our city um, responding to survivors of trafficking. So it was a very eye-opening experience, um, as of course I wasn't naive to that it was happening, um, but that I was naive to how much it was happening and how young it, it was starting. So my, I guess my sort of point of this um, story is it started for me very, very micro. Like we were looking at specific kids and um, through my work we started to um, identify a lot of kids that we were concerned about and that took me to elementary and middle schools and the micro started to get macro really quickly because I realized how many, how many adults we needed to train. So there was this mad rush in my social work brain to train 5,500 staff in a year, right? In public education, it's like not even humanly possible because you get like three PD days a year. So we brought in, we had a relationship with Stephanie and Set Me Free and we did a, a training video and it's ended up um, being very, very widely um, attended and popular and lots of interest. Um, and so keeping on this train of, of micro, I was keeping my own data and um, realized we had 98% of our youth that we had sort of verified um, were survivors of trafficking. 98% um, of them were brown or black. And 98% and were system involved. So they were in the custody of the Department of Human Services or being supervised by another system like a juvenile court officer. So the opportunity that that came looking at the challenges money we lose prevention public schools have no money so prevention gets cut immediately um, we have uh, in my red state bans um, on specific topics and increasing um, calls for parental control so the opportunity that came to um, collaborate with the University of Nebraska and set me free um, now is mass macro because it allowed us a student advisory board who's leading the work. We hadn't had those voices at the table. We had stakeholders, but they weren't necessarily organized in the way our, our grant is doing that now. And uh, parents... Uh, advisory group. So it, it to me, I just really want to um, get the point across that when there isn't funds and there is a need, really collaboration is um, collaboration in a bigger way that I ever thought was possible um, is out there for you. I think that's enough. Thank you. All right, I'm just gonna talk for like two minutes and then we wanna have a, a few minutes for you all to share. Um, so I think, um, you know, it's interesting, right? The title of this talk is on sexual violence prevention and we haven't actually talked about sexual violence a lot, but we've talked about something really, really important. Um, 
you know, if you, for those of you who know the stop SV CDC technical assistance package, one of the things in there is safe, nurturing and caring environments. And that's a lot about what we've talked about today. And that's something that's so critical, particularly for youth of color, particularly for queer youth um, and multiply minoritized youth, right? Youth who occupy multiple minoritized identities. And so I think we've highlighted, right, how, and what we find in our work is that when youth, when, when uh, youth of color, queer youth, when they have safe, nurturing environments, they feel affirmed, they feel loved, they feel safe, we see violence go down, right? And then we also often see them joining with us, like Robin, right, and to fight these systems of oppression, which are both healing and liberating at an individual level, but at a much more collective level, powerful as well. Um, and we can't do this. Like if we're researchers and we're in like our little boxes alone, like I can't, the work that I was doing before I started doing deep par, like it was, it, it, it was, it wasn't as effective. I mean, if you're a statistician, like your effect sizes just weren't as good. Um, and I think too, you know, that the, there's so much we can learn from youth lived experience, practitioner lived experiences, um, things that they're learning on the ground in the moment that really inform our work as researchers. Um, and I think, you know, I'd like to think some days that my like research data literature review brain is helpful to the work that we do as well. Um, but one of the things that we talk about too is lived experiences and that being a legitimate source of knowing and being and that we can bring that into our work and that we can also bring emotion into our work. Um, and I've just put up a, like a random slide up here. You know, if you, I actually had no training in participatory action research as a graduate student. I basically got my first grant in South Dakota. Um, had never even been there. Long story how that happened. Got off a plane and was like, I have to like relearn how to do research or I'm going to literally get thrown out of town. Um, and then I learned about PAR and I was like, oh, I think this might work. And it did. <laughs> um, and it's also a lot more fun. Um, so I think, you know, for researchers, there's lots of ways to learn about this. If this is a new kind of these partnerships, happy to share more readings with you. Um, for practitioners, you know, like, if you feel like there could be benefit to your research or to your practice work, to your advocacy, uh, reach out to researchers. Are there any people local at your uni like a local university, local college? Um, you know, even Googling things like faculty research and then whatever you're interested in, right? Like you might get some hits there. Um, and then again, thinking about the way it can be beneficial to you, right? Like the last thing you want is to just be there to promote a researcher's agenda because that again is not in line with the values of PAR. Um, so I think we will stop there and then take uh, whatever little bit of time we have left, uh, maybe 10 minutes, um, 10, 11 minutes, for you all to, to share questions, comments, feedback, and so forth. Also, can we get a big round of applause for everyone that just shared? Thank you so much. Now you may ask your questions. What would you say, and this question I think is more targeted to Robin, is the best way to get youth involved without like tokenizing them or saying like, I'm going to exploit your lived experience? Like what is the best way to engage them? So I can honestly speak for the way that uh, Katie did, Katie and I worked to do advertising for PRISM, which is... I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with saying we are trying to do this kind of work and we are looking for people with lived experience in X, Y, and Z. The, where it becomes tokenizing is where you are making assumptions about their experience or saying, I'm pretty sure I know what, say, queer youth have gone through and I want this kind of feedback, so I'm going to seek these kinds of demographics. That's when it becomes trying to exploit their lived experience. But if you're just being open about hey, I'm trying to study how you are affected by these external things, and I'm trying to learn from your experience and prioritize what you have gone through, even if it's not necessarily what I expected. I think that's the, the healthy approach towards seeking information from youth with certain experiences. I'm not a panelist, so I apologize, but also compensating people for their lived, for sharing their lived experiences, yes. that does not happen enough, and that is like a really horrific practice um, in sexual violence prevention. That's all, y'all are really cool. I just wanna say first, thank you all so much. This has been so good for me. I'm on the um, verge of writing a grant to ask for a lot of money. 
sexual violence prevention in a school district with about 50,000 students. And right now it's just me. So like trying to, would you recommend like piloting at one school? Like how do you decide where you start when you have limited capacity? Uh, thank you for the f positive feedback. And wow, 50,000, that's a big district. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think, I guess a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, I mean, to me, that's like the beauty of partnerships, right? Like I would be really lonely if I had to do this work alone. And I think, you know, the more that there are partnerships and supports to help with with the, the grant writing, you know, when possible. I mean, I think too, you know, sometimes starting smaller, you know, or starting with the pilot can be, you know, from a funding perspective can be a bit more compelling, right? And also feel a little less overwhelming, um, you know, for you uh, on your own. Um, and happy to chat more, happy to chat more after. Yeah, it's a really important question. Yeah. I think that, um, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here, but we, I don't think our grant, so Set Me Free, University of Nebraska and Des Moines Public Schools would be going as well as it is if we didn't have relationships with each other and trust, and we've, we've grown into that. Um, and then there's one other professional, my colleague within the schools, and I would recommend um, making sure that you have connections to people in the district that can make big decisions and support the work. If we didn't have support to do this, we wouldn't be able to, to provide this prevention curriculum to every ninth through 12th grader in our district over five years. So we are starting small. We're piloting one school. I mean, it's not really a pilot, small, yeah. One high school, one alternative school. Um, and I think that was mainly for us to work out the kinks, um, but I think the support of the district is, is really key. And us kind of being at the district level, being able to sort of make things happen. Whereas if I was a building level social worker, I, I would have no impact to make this happen, if that makes sense. And I would just like to add, for some reason, this work is extremely um, competitive. And there's a lot of, you know, I think a lot of times people think in nonprofit or social work, we're all just holding hands, singing Kumbaya. And yet it's like dog eat dog. And so finding the right people that want to collaborate, are collaborative, and aren't, you know, just trying to hold on so tightly is so critical, I think, to the success of the work that we're doing. Yeah. Hello, thank you for your uh, for sharing uh, everything that you're doing and for doing what you're doing. Um, when I was a baby advocate, I was trained that when we did risk reduction or any kind of education, we didn't do it in mixed gender groups because of power imbalances and because we did not want to train possible, maybe could be future uh, sexual perpetrator, sexual violence perpetrators on how to circumvent safety measures that a possible could be future victim, right, to use binary language. <laughs> um, so what is the modern day recommendation on doing preventative education in mixed gendered groups? <laughs> okay, so I can't talk about modern day recommendations from a professional standpoint, but my like initial reaction to that is people can be perpetrators regardless of their sex or gender. People can be victims regardless of their sex or gender. And you always run the risk of accidentally training a perpetrator regardless of how you gender the people that you are trying to educate. And I think in situations where you are trying to segregate based on sex or gender, 
you run the risk of making assumptions. Like, because you have an M or an F on your birth certificate or ID, you're this. Because you look like this or talk like this or your voice sounds like this, therefore, you are more or less dangerous. And my recommendation, not as a professional, but just as a trans youth, is that those assumptions all just kind of need to go. And you need to regard the people that you're trying to protect as people that you're trying to protect and acknowledge the risk of accidentally that happening. Because you can't really regulate that based on gendered lines. And any attempt to, I feel, would, would be making assumptions based on appearance, presentation, or gender identity that have no correlation in actual reality. Can I add to that? Yeah. And actually, really quickly, I just want to add to what Robin said. We always work in mixed groups, always, because we, we don't know who is in the room. And to assume, again, that, that goes back to that stereotype, right, that the the victims are always girls and the perpetrators are always boys. And so when we talk about healthy versus unhealthy relationships or human trafficking or anything like that, we actually walk in with the assumption that everyone in the room could be an individual being trafficked or um, be a, a, somebody who is abused. Everyone in the room could be a trafficker or someone who is a perpetrator of abuse. You have to walk in with that assumption because you do not know who is in the room. And separating according to um, stereotypical gender actually makes it very difficult for individuals who um, to feel like they're in a safe space or to be able to disclose if that is something that they might want to do. I'll say, um, you know, across all the different programs that we have, they're um, pretty much all mixed gender with, with a couple exceptions. So um, the Sexual Violence Prevention Center that we have on Pine Ridge um, actually has different programs for different ages, different gender identities. Um, and so, for example, what we're doing is with um, uh, Lakota girls or individuals who identify as girls, women on the femininity spectrum, um, also trans, two-spirit youth, um, they're taking an feminist empowerment self-defense class. And then there's also a program that's more um, for, uh, essentially for cis, cis boys, uh, really about what is their journey to manhood. And so I do think that there are some contexts and situations, and again, that's that cultural piece, right? Like where it can be appropriate. I think we have to think about, like we have to move away from sex assigned at birth, right? But thinking about what are our, because sexual violence is, is gendered. And so I do think there are some spaces and context in which it is appropriate to think about how can we explore like our gendered experiences of sexual violence. So again, it's a very nuanced kind of, I think, topic. But anyways, I think we're out of time. Yeah, go ahead. The only yeah. thing I was going to say is in the queer community, there's a new movement called Flinta. Um, has anyone heard of Flinta? So it's this idea, basically, um, you can explore it on your own time because we're out of time. But Flinta stands for female or woman, lesbian, intersex, non-binary, trans, and agender individuals. And it's essentially like groups and spaces that do not include cisgender men. Um, and it is a far more inclusive way to kind of begin having these conversations because um, being a black person, I'm always ready to call a thing a thing. And a lot of the times when we're really having these conversations, it's, it's kind of having a conversation around cisgender men. And so there is a movement within the queer community called Flinta where we're moving away from um, calling something a woman's space per, per se and saying it's a space for folks who may be more femme presenting, who may not be on that spectrum and may not be cisgender men. So look up Flinta. Thank you. And we are unfortunately all out of time. So let's give a big round of applause to our presenters.